Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping with us today. The Council has the following announcements. The Church visitors hope to meet the Lord willing with the Consistory on May 16th. If anyone wishes to address the Church visitors, please notify your District Elder as soon as possible. Consistory has examined brothers Cam Ewald and Devin Van Assen, who have requested to publicly profess their faith. If no lawful objections are brought forward, their public profession will be the Lord willing on May 21st in the morning worship service. Council hopes to meet Lord willing on Tuesday, May 9th at 7.30 at the church and the Barhead Young People's Society invite the seniors to a coffee social after the second service this afternoon. Our offerings today are for the work of Asian Mission. So far, the announcements, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive now the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us praise our God together in song by singing from Psalm 117. Let us now together with heart and voice make profession of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith by singing together the words of the Apostles' Creed as they're set to music in hymn one. Let us now go to our God in prayer and seek his blessing upon us this afternoon. Let us pray. 
Our faithful Father in heaven, You are the one true God, the God of life, the God of grace and salvation. And we acknowledge that by nature we are ignorant of You. Even though all creation proclaims Your glory, we often fail to see it. Even though we are made in Your image, we do not always recognize or acknowledge You as the source and origin of our lives. And even though You have spoken words of truth, unbroken and unfailing in Holy Scripture, yet we are, are so often deaf to it, so slow to listen and obey its directives, to heed its corrections, its rebukes, and even to accept its promises and, and encouragements. And so, Lord, as we are about to hear your word announced to us once again this afternoon, we pray for the enlightening work of your Spirit. We pray that your Spirit will give us ears to hear and minds which understand and hearts that are open and motivated with a deep desire to listen to the message we are receiving so that we will not be distracted, but rather be engaged and attentive. May the way that we hear your word reflect the respect that we have for you, the God of the word, the God who is not silent, but the God who has spoken and still speaks to us today, through the words printed on the pages of the holy book you've inspired and set apart for us as the truth that we need to know for your glory and our salvation. So, Father, we pray that you will always set before us in this place the public proclamation of your word. May the message of salvation which you entrusted to the church in Scripture always be preached and heard among us here in, in its power and in its purity and bestow your spirit upon us so that we may always faithfully profess your word before this world. And we ask you to give us opportunity to reach out and share the message of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to love our neighbors enough to, show, to share the truth with them. And so we pray for the conversion of many sinners in this community. We ask that all those who are not yet joined to Christ in true faith and ardent love may be added to His church. Father, we pray that by Your grace, this congregation may be a beacon of hope to the people who surround us here. Bless and multiply the connections and relationships that we have through our work, through our neighborhood acquaintances, through formerly, uh, formerly organized efforts spearheaded and arranged by the Evangelism Committee, and through other ways besides these. Father, we pray that doors may be opened all around us to speak of the good news and the great joy that is for all who believe in Jesus Christ, so that by our faithful witness through word and deed, as instruments in your hand and instruments for the cause of your kingdom, we may provide a winsome and attractive testimony of the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. So, Father, hear our prayer, for we bring this all before you in Christ's name alone. Amen. Let us again join our hearts together in song by singing from Psalm 104, stanzas 1 and 4.
I invite you now to turn with me in God's Word to read from our Scripture passage this afternoon in connection with Lord's Day 28. We read together from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verses 17 through 30. Here we find in Matthew's Gospel the celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples celebrating the Passover meal where our Lord and Savior instituted the Lord's Supper. So we read together from Matthew 26, verse 17 and following. Hear now God's holy and inspired word. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So far, our reading from God's Word. Let us now turn also to the summary of God's Word as we find it in Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 28. Lord's Day 28, being the first Lord's Day regarding the Lord's Supper, what the church confesses in accordance with God's word regarding this meal. So we read together Lord's Day 28, which is found in the back of our book of praise, page 542 and following. And our confession reads as follows. How does the Lord's Supper signify and seal to you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat of this broken bread and drink of this cup in remembrance of him. With this command, he gave these promises. First, As surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely was his body offered for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I receive from the hand of the minister and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely does he himself nourish and refresh my soul to eternal life with his crucified body and shed blood. 
What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his shed blood? First, to accept with a believing heart all the suffering and the death of Christ and so receive forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Second, to be united more and more to his sacred body through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us. Therefore, although Christ is in heaven and we are on earth, yet we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, and we forever live and are governed by one spirit, as the members of our body are by one soul. Where has Christ promised that he will nourish and refresh believers with his body and blood as surely as they eat this broken bread and drink of this cup? In the institution of the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This promise is repeated by Paul where he says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is, is, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So far, our reading of the church's confession. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing from Psalm 23, stanzas 1 and 3. Psalm 23, stanzas 1 and 3, following the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you are undoubtedly aware, our modern age has given rise to a, a great number of new words which describe new ideas and concepts from the field or in the field of technology. Take, for instance, a word like online. Someone living 25 years ago or more might hear that word and think you're talking about the laundry hanging outside. Or take the word hyperlink. Hyperlink. And you might, you might wonder if that has something to do with energetic children playing the game Red Rover linking their arms, holding hands. Another new word that has been invented as part of the jargon of this technological age is the word emoticon. Emoticon. Most of you, I'm sure, if you've grown up with the internet and are familiar with cell phones, you, you'll know what an emoticon is. It comes from two words mashed together, emotion, and icon, emotion and icon, emoticon. So while, while you're composing a text message on your cell phone, you have the option to add to your words a picture or two or, or a hundred if you're so inclined, be it a heart or a happy face or something else, to express your emotions that much more clearly. And so an emoticon is useful when words alone are not enough. Now where am I going with this? Well, that is similar to what God has done for us with the sacraments, visible signs and symbols. He has given us his word, the scriptures and the preaching of them, and they are sufficient in themselves to bring us to faith. And yet, God goes the extra mile, as it were, to reveal himself not only uh, to us in word, but also in symbols through baptism and the Lord's Supper. And in the past few Lord's Days, we've considered baptism as a symbolic washing but that picture alone does not 
represent the fullness of the truth of what salvation through Christ means for us. And so, alongside the sacrament of baptism, the Lord has also given us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to showcase other aspects, other important truths of Jesus Christ and the work that he accomplished. And so that is what we will be considering this afternoon as I proclaim to you the word of God as summarized in Lord's Day 28 under this theme, at the Lord's table we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of Jesus Christ. We'll consider how this is first a vivid reminder and secondly a vital participation. First it's a vivid reminder Brothers and sisters, I think we can all understand that it's, it's possible to become so accustomed to something, a certain practice or tradition if you do it long enough, that you lose sight of the fact that for many other people looking in from the outside who have never practiced what you practice, that practice could be shocking, confusing, even bizarre. We can think about that when we think about the practice of the Lord's Supper. Already in the, in the days of the early church, some uninformed outsiders even misunderstood that practice. Uh, they misunderstood the Lord's Supper to be an act of cannibalism, which of course emphatically it is not. Now we just read the account in scripture, the historical account of what took place in the final week of Jesus' life and earthly ministry, and we're all very familiar with the story. We know the outcome, we know the ending of the story, where it led to, that, that we might lose sight of just how shocking that must have been for the disciples gathered with Jesus for that last meal, the Passover meal, together. Think of all the things that were going on with Jesus and that group of disciples. For some time, Jesus had been hinting to them carefully and discreetly that a time was coming when this Messiah, this King, who he claimed to be, the one who proclaimed the kingdom of God to be at hand, he was going to be handed over to die. He was going to be put to death like a criminal. This was very disturbing to the disciples, as we can well imagine. They had other expectations, other dreams in their minds of what the Messiah would do and, and what he would be and what his kingdom would be. How he would be welcomed with, with open arms by his people in order to establish his kingdom. Certainly, nowhere in the equation for them was a cross of crucifixion. But in those last hours leading up to the crucifixion, they're about to celebrate the Passover, the meal that was in many ways the highlight of the Jewish festival year. It was a commemoration of that great act of God's deliverance. In the minds of the Jews, the exodus out of Egypt was the, the ultimate act of deliverance as far as they were concerned. Instead of being annihilated and wiped out under Pharaoh, God entered the picture and rescued them in miraculous ways. Think of all the plagues. And it re represented, this deliverance was represented so vividly and powerfully in that all who were of Israel were spared of from the death of the firstborn because of, of the blood, of course, that was put on the door frames of their houses. And they were brought out of Egypt, not in some kind of secret way, out some back door, as you could say, but, but publicly, in front of the eyes of all the Egyptians. It was a great display, a powerful display of God's power to save and so the Passover was a time of celebration and festivity for the Israelites. And this was no less true for Jesus and for his disciples as they go up to the upper room where they gather to celebrate the Passover together. 
Now then think for a minute, why does Jesus choose that time, that moment in history, in his ministry to the disciples? Why then does he institute what we know as the Lord's Supper? Think about that. Well, it makes sense when we see the important connection that he wants to make. The disciples were expecting to celebrate God's great deliverance long ago, in the past. When Israel obtained their freedom as a, as a nation, but Jesus wants to draw his, his disciples' attention to an even greater deliverance that would happen, the ultimate deliverance which he would accomplish in the most unusual and most unexpected of ways. For imagine the shock, the horror experienced by the disciples when during that meal Jesus takes the, the loaf of bread and he begins to pull the, the bread apart and he says, this is my body. Do this. Eat this in remembrance of me. Jesus had said something like this earlier when speaking to the crowd in John 6. He said, If you will not eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no place in the kingdom of heaven. And many among the crowds who were following him at that time were disgusted and appalled by what he said, and they left him. And from that time on, they dismissed him. And they disregarded his credibility and they didn't follow him any longer. So now imagine those disciples seeing that bread broken and thinking, this is Jesus' body being depicted here. This is Jesus' body being broken. This is our deliverer. How can this be? And then he follows this up by, by picking a cup up filled with wine. And he says, this cup is the cup of blessing, the cup of my blood poured out, the blood of the new covenant. Don't you think they, they would have shuddered at that thought? His blood poured out. But Jesus teaches his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is therefore a meal of remembrance, a reminder of what Jesus has done. Now why does God need to remind us in this way? Why this visual demonstration of the Gospel? Well, it's because we so easily forget. We need reminders because we forget and we let our focus drift elsewhere so that we think that a that our source of strength and assurance is to be found somewhere else, be it in our golden reputation, having it all together in the sight of others, having the best behaved children in the world has ever known, having the, the best paying job and other status symbols that we look to that indicate our success in life. We can, so, we can look to so many other things and our vision can get cloudy and our, our hope and our trust gets misplaced. We can get so distracted because we downplay and we dismiss and we minimize our own sinfulness and the great work of Jesus Christ to overcome it. That's why the Lord says, Here, I want to remind you, this is where sin has been dealt with. This is where you find forgiveness and strength to persevere and hope for the future. Isn't it amazing that the Lord's Supper meal teaches us all these things? It teaches us forgiveness for the past, through the past sacrifice of Christ. It teaches us strength for today, for the struggles and the challenges that we face today. And it teaches us hope for the future, anticipating the greater meal to come, when all the greater blessings we will enjoy when we will one day eat of the huge feast, the, the rich heaping banquet of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, in the week ahead, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, 
pray that you will see your need to be reminded of all these things and to have these truths impressed upon our hearts and lives so that the rich meaning of the Lord's Supper will not elude us, will not escape us, but will, will fill us with, with wonder and amazement and joy and rejuvenation as a result of the blessings that Christ has obtained for us through his sacrificial death in our place. This brings us now to our second point, looking at how the Lord's Supper is a vital reminder, a vital participation, sorry. Well, it is helpful to see how the Catechism emphasizes that the Lord's Supper is not just a remembrance. It's not just a time to reflect upon something that took place 2,000 years ago in history. But you and I, all who partake, are called to be participants in that. We are not just spectators. For in the Lord's Supper, there is an interaction taking place. Some call it a dialogue or a conversation. The Lord speaks to us showing us what he has done for us through his love by providing Christ as a sacrifice for our sins so that we can be strengthened moving onward by the nourishment he gives. That's one side of it. But there's another side to it as well. That other side is that, it, remember, it's not, a, it's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. The Lord's Supper is, is not just God speaking to us. We in turn speak to God. How? Well, through the language of faith. Through the language of faith. The Catechism wants to emphasize that as well. The Lord's Supper is not some empty ritual that we practice. It's not a mere formal custom that we do, simply going through the motions. But it is about faith speaking, faith participating, faith being assured by means of the Lord. And you can see that in the regular refrain in question and answer 75, a, a refrain that's almost poetic. It's midway through the answer, answer 75. All the lines there, if, you're, if your edition of the Catechism has the same formatting as, as mine in the Book of Praise, all the lines end with the word me, or, and, and most often, for me. For me. There's my part in the participation in Christ's sacrifice. It's a receiving role. We receive by faith the spiritual realities of what the physical signs and seals are given us, given to show us. The Lord's Supper was given for those who know and believe that Christ was sacrificed for them, for you, and for me. That is to say, the Lord's Supper is for our assurance. The Catechism says, As surely as I receive from the hand of the minister and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely does he himself nourish and refresh my soul to eternal life with his crucified body and shed blood. Well, this is how the Lord's Supper is a seal, a guarantee, a promise given to you by the Lord that just as we see with our eyes, just as we taste with our mouths, you may be assured that the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ has covered all your sins, that all you need for this life and for eternity is found in Jesus Christ. And we need that assurance, don't we, brothers and sisters? We need that assurance because we struggle with our doubts. We struggle with our temptations. Do we not? When we're honest with ourselves, we know how great our sinfulness and our sinful reality really is. <clears throat> if we are stuck in a sin and we cannot seem to get over it and get past it and it keeps tripping us up and knocking us down... We might think that the Lord couldn't possibly have died to forgive me for what I've done. And so we need assurance. Because our faith struggles. 
Our faith is weak. And because we are sometimes brought through very difficult circumstances that, that pose a great test and trial for our faith, and we may reach the, the breaking point, and we wonder if we can go on, and we wonder how the Lord could possibly use this situation for my benefit, for His glory and for my joy. And you cannot put the pieces together they don't seem to fit, to see, to understand the Lord's leading in your life, how that can be right, how that can be fair. It, it seems sometimes like the Lord is a million miles away, completely disinterested, unconcerned, or that He's simply punishing us. Well, the Lord's Supper means everything for us. For it is an assurance that God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So the Lord's Supper is not just for our remembrance. If we think of it only as that, then we reduce its meaning. And we flatten the Lord's Supper to much less than it was intended to be. It was meant to be a reminder and an assurance and an invitation to come and dine in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And our participation in this, our side of, of the interaction or the dialogue, uh, is, as was mentioned, through faith. That is, we are not eating the physical body and blood of Christ as if Christians were cannibals. No, absolutely not. As question and answer 76 makes clear, to eat the crucified body and blood and drink the shed blood of Christ is the language of faith. We accept the bread and the wine with a believing heart so that we can, so we understand these elements as representative of the suffering of Jesus Christ for us. But there's more. For, for we receive these elements as a catechism through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us to be united more and more to His sacred body. That's the kind of communion that we have. We, co we spiritually commune with Christ. Even though He is in heaven and we are on earth, yet our union is such that we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bones. And we forever live on and are governed by one spirit as the members of our body are by one soul. So what should be our response when we have Lord's Supper? What does the Lord want us to understand when the minister holds up the bread and, and, and breaks it apart? Well, He wants you to see it. But not only that, He wants you to see yourself as a participant in that action. Not just idle, uh, idle or passive spectators, but active participants. That is why we don't just look at, at the elements spread out on the table, like we're at a museum or, or at a morgue uh, where the exhibit is for viewing only. No, the elements get distributed, they get dispersed, and they're received, taken, and eaten. We are given bread to represent that which satisfies our deepest longing, just as bread satisfies our material need and, and fills us up and gratifies our hunger. So much more than does the crucified body of Jesus Christ satisfy our, our deepest, our greatest longing, which is to be reconciled to God who made us for fellowship with Him. As bread made of grain is life-sustaining physically and temporarily. So Jesus Christ, the bread of life, is life-sustaining spiritually and eternally. He is vital for our vitality, for living for Him and for the cause of His kingdom. But notice that not only is the bread of the Lord's Supper presented, but it is broken. Surely that would have made a deep impression upon the disciples 
but it should be no less true for us. This bread is my body which is for you, Christ says to us. Don't you think the disciples would have, would have gasped when they heard him say this to them? Must he really do this? Yes, he must. He has been saying that for some time in his earthly ministry, and they would come to understand later that that was the only way that he could satisfy their greatest longing and save them through going to the cross. And so when we look at the bread being broken and the wine being poured out, consider how the Lord Jesus loved you and me and how much He loves His Father too. That He would obey the Father's will even going as far as to lay down His life. That makes us profoundly humble and thankful and joyful. Any wonder then why Jesus chose to use wine with, as that which represented his blood? Wine in the Bible often has the connotation of celebration and joy and festivity. For he could have chosen water, which refreshes. He could have chosen milk, which sustains. But he chose wine because it brings joy and celebration, symbolic of the joy that belongs to the kingdom of heaven that awaits us. So then, it is significant that Christ chose a meal to convey the message of the gospel. For it reminds us that we are not self-sustaining. For what happens if, if you were to go a number of days without eating or drinking? Well, boys and girls, you'd know, you, you'd die. You're going to die. You were not made to live on your own, in your own strength. You were, made, you were not made to be independent or self-sustaining. You are a dependent creature. And the Lord's Supper powerfully teaches us that and speaks to that, doesn't it? Our life doesn't come from anywhere else but from Him. And so in the Lord's Supper, we, as it were, act out our faith our personal reliance on the sacrificial death of Christ. As Lord's Day 29, question and answer 79, will go on to say, as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. And so our participation is not just that we see the food and drink before us, but we consume it, we intake it, we digest it and savor it. We make it our own, that's the point. So this meal is more than about refueling. You know the way that some people devour food. They scarf down their food and in a few seconds. They skip the chewing and go straight to swallowing, it seems. Some people eat like that. It's, it's like they're just refueling, like they would refuel a car with gasoline. Well, the Lord's Supper is like that. It's not a time for, for stuffing one's face full nor is it a time of, of simply resupplying and restocking our system with the nutrients we need. But it is a meal that is a time of intimate friendship and closeness, a time of sharing the love of Christ with Christ and within the fellowship of the believers. Christ hosts us at his meal, and he is also the substance of that meal. So let us conclude this sermon by considering the question, how should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? What should be the tone? What should be the posture of the Lord's Supper? Should it be a, a somber and sober affair? Should it be something that has a similar sadness to it as, as that of, of a funeral, for instance? I think we'd be mistaken if we thought that that was how the Lord wants us to, to commemorate His Supper. It would be better to understand the Lord's Supper with a combination of joy and dignity. Joy and dignity. It should be joyful. An expression of our deep delight in the good news of Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. But it should also be dignified. 
should be dignified. For something that is joyful without being dignified can easily veer off into something that becomes flippant, trivial, light and trite. So it should be dignified, especially when we consider that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, for our joy, for our celebration. And therefore it's no coincidence, it's certainly no error that the title of our form for the Lord's Supper in the book of praise reads, form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The meal is a celebration because it is a proclamation of Christ's victory over sin and judgment and hell, as well as an anticipation of the great day that is coming when Christ will take us to himself and share with us the great banquet he has prepared for all who believe. May the Lord's Supper always draw our focus to these wonderful truths and realities that we may serve the one who served himself for us. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for our celebration of the Lord's Supper next week, Sunday morning, let us read together the words that begin the form for Lord's Supper, including our calling to give self-examination of our lives. Beloved, in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In order that we may now celebrate this Holy Supper of the Lord to our comfort next week, we must first rightly examine ourselves. Further, we must use it as Christ intended it, namely to his remembrance. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness, so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great, that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart, whether he also believes the sure promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy, to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. With that in mind, let us go to the Lord in prayer, in prayer of thanksgiving. Father in heaven, we thank you for so stooping down to our weak faith that you would give us signs and seals, symbols, by which we may see and taste and smell and touch and feel in order to know for certain of your great love for us. We thank you for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a beautifully rich emblem of your love, as a beautifully rich expression of the gift of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Father, forgive us whenever we do not value and appreciate this great sacrament as we ought to. Help us to see it as a means of grace so that we come with hearts full of faith, with expectation, with joy, with reverence, with thankfulness, but also with great celebration. Lord, we pray that we may indeed celebrate this sacrament with joy and dignity, and that there may be a real longing to celebrate it, to be reminded, and to receive assurance of our communion with Christ, knowing that, he, that something even greater awaits us in the age to come. Lord, in the week ahead, dedicate our hearts and minds to preparing rightly for the Lord's Supper celebration to take place next week. Father, where there is sin in our lives, cause us to see it and root it out through repentance. Enable us to see and know your grace in Jesus Christ, to believe in him, to put our trust fully in him, and work in our hearts a true spirit of thankfulness. And Father, help us all to live in the unity of the one true faith. Empower us to seek and give forgiveness according to your will, so that you will be glorified in us. Lord, we pray for the expansion and advancement of your kingdom all over this world. Cause your church to be blessed with increase and allow her to flourish Thus we pray for a blessing upon all the ministers and missionaries of your word, all the, especially the minister, missionaries that you have enabled us to send into different places in this world. We pray for Reverend Dong in the lower mainland of BC and his work also overseas among the Asian community. As we also collect for that cause this afternoon, we pray that you will bless those funds collected, that they may serve for the purpose of making the name of Jesus Christ more known, the truth of what he has done, that it is heard and 
spread and proclaimed. We also pray for Reverend Tim Shooten in Prince George, B.C. And we pray especially for the missionaries laboring in Brazil. We thank you for hearing our prayers and opening the way for Reverend Jim Wedevane to make it to the field to begin his work there shortly. We thank you for the news that the adoption process for their children could go through, that they could receive definite approval for all the members of the family to move out of this country in due time. Lord, we thank you and we pray that you will, will bless the Wittavanes as they make this transition and enable them to settle well into a, a new life and a new place to carry out the service that you have called our brother to. Lord, also give Reverend Ken Whiskey the strength that he needs to do his work. Bless the continuing work of the calling committee of Aldergrove Church as they look for a third missionary for the field. And we pray that the opportunities to spread the gospel may be blessed with much success. Lord, we pray for the work of our theological seminary in Hamilton. As another academic year comes to a close, we pray that professors and students alike may together enjoy a, a restful break. Lord, we pray that you will continue to equip the professors there to continue to train men for the task of ministering your word. May you bless all their efforts. May you richly pour out your wisdom upon them that they may pour it out upon those to whom they teach that they may provide good guidance and advice and instruction so that the work of the seminary may yield many capable men who are well equipped for the ministry of your holy word. We also pray for the young men considering the ministry. We pray that you will stir up in the hearts of many young men, even in this congregation, the passion and desire to become a minister of the Holy Gospel. Lord, we know that this office is full of challenges, but it is also one that is full of joy. And we pray that one day many, any number of the young men of this congregation may know the joy of the task of proclaiming your word week in and week out, whether that is here in Canada or in some other country, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, we also recognize that today is the final Sunday of the, the long-time active ministry of your servant, Reverend Ralph Pontier, of our neighboring congregation of the Nearlandia United Reformed Church. Lord, we thank you for the strength and energy you gave him to preach your word faithfully in season and out of season. And for the many times he also led our worship services here in this place, especially during our period of vacancy, feeding us in the green pastures of your word. Bless him and his wife Lois as they go from here and as they make the move back to, to their homeland in the U.S. and as they enter a new stage of life and cause them to be a blessing in their new home and community. We pray, Lord, also for our sister church, the Emmanuel URC, that you will bless their search for a new preacher and teacher in due time and continue to supply all they need for this process. Father in heaven, forgive all of our sins, also those that we have committed today. Be with us as we go our ways home. Give us a restful Sunday evening and give us strength to take up our tasks and callings again tomorrow wherever you have placed us to do it all to your honor and glory with joy and thankfulness in our hearts. So hear us, for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness as collected by the deacons. And after the offering has been collected, let us sing our closing song from Psalm 116, stanzas 1, 5, 7, and nine.